So one of the things that um, over the years absolutely shocked me about anything banking and finance related uh, was how non-predictive the technologies were. Everything was pretty much uh, counting what was happening, uh, facilitating things that are happening now. Uh, but it was very hard, I think. And some of that was due to lack of technology. Some was due to lack of data. Some was due to lack of just time and energy spent building it uh, on more like the predictive analytics and, and kind of using what we know today to tell us what's going to happen in the future. It feels like this open banking, embedded banking kind of busts down that wall and creates a world where there's so much data and there's so much technology and so many integrations that uh, there really can be, and, and maybe there is being a very big rise in a lot of these predictive technologies. Um. Completely agree with you. But what's interesting is I that's where I, I think this theme of new kind of data companies is what is the next next thing. Okay. So explain today, that. yeah. So today everybody's trying to act on um, you know, this, these breadcrumbs that we leave all around the world, right? And a bank is a bank or somebody else is trying to say, hey, which are the best customers to lend to based on their link, what's happening with this business on LinkedIn, how many people they're hiring, what they've bought, et cetera. Um, and what I think is the future and what we've based our company on is what I'm calling like the custodial age of data. And what I mean by that is that the new kind of data opportunities will morph from their current state, which is this, this massive amount of side effect information that you then need to apply AI on to, to you know, make sense of. Um, you know, she read an article on business process automation, right? And, and so let's feed her ads for, the, for every CRM and workflow app out there there for the next 12 months. I'm currently experiencing that. So it's one of my pet peeves, right? Instead of Fineband, we think that the most interesting opportunities will arise from the intentional sharing of actual data and actual intent with bounded and enforced usage rights around that data. Um, and so when, when you talk about like the AI implications, right, instead of having it being artificial information, what about having it being actual information. Um, and, you know, the best predictor of the future is actually the past, right? Um, so the most interesting new platform businesses, you know, in, in my opinion, won't be the ones that are amassing the most data, but, but instead they'll be the platforms that provide the best access, data owner control, and, and watermarking services. Um, to the data exchanges that matter, right? And the data exchanges that matter, I believe, are you know, between a bank and its customers. And, okay, so let's dig a little bit deeper on that because I think it's a really interesting view of the world. Uh, historically, let's take you know social media companies, finance companies, all, all these different types of companies. Uh, they basically had a couple of different assets. Uh, most financial investors would look at you know, how much revenue do you have, what's your profitability, how many users do you have, all of that kind of stuff. Inside of the companies, and literally I worked at Facebook for two years, so I know, uh, the more access to information you have, the better you can make the product, the more personalized, the more contextual, the longer somebody will stay, the more ads you can serve. Kind of, you know, one of the assets is definitely the more information I get the user to give me, uh, the better this is for us as a company, right? It's kind of one of the, the key tenets. What it sounds like you're talking about, and, and that's true to banks and, and others as well, right? It's kind of sure. the more information, it, the better. What you're talking about is actually almost flipping the model and saying, no, the winners of tomorrow are going to be the people who don't look at it as uh, from the corporation seat. Instead, they look at it from the user seat and they say, what can we as a business do to empower this user to have the best experience, the most privacy, the most efficiency, kind of all of that. And a lot of it's actually going to be not to hold on to the data. It's going to be to give the user the data, to give them permissioning, to give them all sorts of tools that maybe historically they haven't had uh, because incentives weren't aligned between the corporation and, uh, and the end user. Is that fair to say? Um, that's not only really fair. That's probably a better way of saying it than, than I do at my pitch. So I'll invite you to um, my next sales pitch. No, no, no. no. Um, you, you do a fantastic job. <laughs> Um, but in all seriousness, like when I, you know, as I, as I talked about, you know, founding Fizeband, sitting there quietly in my basement, Googling away, um, 
I believe that the value of FISPAN to our customers, the banks, and ultimately to allow them to provide value to their customers is precisely because I, as FISPAN, assert no ownership or usage rights over any of the data that traverses my network, right? So, um, and the apps I built on behalf of the bank, so our JP Morgan Chase, you know, uh, ERP extension isn't branded Fispan. It's it's branded JP Morgan. It's a it's a service of JP Morgan Chase to their customer. But nonetheless, if it's a product I'm building, I'm building permissions inside of it, right? And if when you click and install this extension, and you say I agree to share the vendor file, my vendor file with the bank. It's not for the purpose of the bank marketing to those vendors. It's for the purposes of the bank to uh, you know, provide me with a better accounts payable risk management experience or something like that. So that's just our policy. And we think that that's going to build value in the future. And we are an example of a new kinds of you know, data platform, but there'll be you know, many more other kinds of examples of that. Got it. And then in terms of... Um that from a product building standpoint, it, do you have to have full end-to-end encryption so that not only do you not have ownership or usage of the data, but you actually can't see it? Or is this a situation where uh, you kind of can't really do the job that the product's intended to, right? If you can't see the data. So it's kind of like this hybrid model of you don't want ownership, you don't want... Um, uh, usage, it's more of just like a permission that the user told me to do X with their data, I go do that job, and then I don't do anything else until they tell me to do something else, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we're not there yet. And um, so I, th- I, see, I absolutely see what you're saying. Um, but it just happens that our business model is we're both a you know, technology outsource and servicing outsource component of the bank. So in order to service the clients, we need to see that data. Yep. Um, and that's what I, that, that would be my expectation in yeah. that it, it's different for like, and for those that are listening who may not, who, who may think that we're in the weeds here for a second, uh, take Facebook, for example. Uh, if Lisa and I are both on Facebook and I send her a message, uh, other than for advertising purposes, there's no need for Facebook to be able to read what message I sent to Lisa or what message she sends back to me. So you can have kind of full end-to-end encryption where only Lisa can read it or only I can read it. Facebook doesn't need to see that. Now, Facebook would like to see it because they'd like to target us on advertising, whatever. But for the intent and purposes of what we're trying to do in communications, end-to-end encryption makes a lot of sense. When it comes to this information, though, you can imagine if you interacted with your bank, but they couldn't see the amount that you were sending, they really can't kind of do their job. Right. So, so there's certain pieces of information, obviously, that they need, uh, which would make sense in this situation. Yeah. So, um, where we, where we're also not there yet from a technology perspective, is, um, you know, there's there's OAuth, there's all sorts of encryption, tokenization. That technology exists, but I haven't yet seen an embodiment of the what I'm calling watermarking of data, which is like having its intended permissions around its usage um, being enforced um, end to end. So that technology doesn't exist, but we're starting to, uh, within the industry, have discourses about it. So whoever invents that, I think will be, and it's not going to be me, but that will be another example of a very valuable technology and business to be introduced.